Hi from me, Jared Epstein, and welcome to another episode of Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm still here at home and very excited to be with you for the next 30 minutes. Earlier this year, the South African Jewish Museum in Cape Town hosted a talk by Dr. Shimon Lev, which focused on Gandhi and the biographies of some of Gandhi's lesser known Jewish supporters during his time living in South Africa. Simcha was there to capture the event. I'm not sure how many people are aware of that, but the formative years of Gandhi, all of them happened in South Africa. And it had a broader implication about what's the political effort later between the two national movement, the Zionist national movement and the Indian national movement, and also the question of the Holocaust, which was kind of deleting the name of Gandhi from the Jewish discourse because what he said about the Jews, how the Jews should react to the German Nazism. Gandhi grew up in India. He went to study law in England, which was a very unique and it was against his caste rule. And when he finished, he came back to India and he was a complete failure. Nobody knew what to do with him. At that time, the family invested a lot of money sending him to study in England. So he was sent to, to South Africa. And then he encountered the discrimination. And slowly, slowly, he became a very successful lawyer but also the main voice or the main representation of the Indian community. In bottom line, the first non-violent struggle, and maybe the only one that partly was successful, happened here in South Africa. When he returned back to India in 1915, he slowly, slowly became like the national leader of the national movement to get independence from the British, which eventually they got in 47. So, what is interesting, and you know, I think people should be aware here in South Africa, that all his development, all his formative years, everything that he did later on in India, you can find the roots here in South Africa. I divided it to um, who were the, the world of friends in South Africa. The first one, I would say, it's uh, Henry Pollack. He was an English Jew. He was sent to India by Gandhi to lobby the Indian struggle here in South Africa. He was very successful, so in a way you can describe him as the political person of Gandhi. And you can imagine the Indian sending an English Jew to India to work for the Indian cause in South Africa. But in the broader aspect, he's the first one to prepare Gandhi's name when he's returning to South Africa. He was the first one to publish a book about Gandhi. His wife, Emily Graham Pollock, she wrote this book, Gandhi the Man. It's very nice because it's a private conversation with him. Uh, and then the other one is Herman Kallenbach. I, I won't speak about him long, but he was very dominant and successful architect. Uh, and, but you can say that he was the close person in terms of sharing with Gandhi his personal uh, dilemma, conflicts, experiments, and so on. He was less a public figure until the end of the struggle. Uh, they established together Toaster Farm, but Toaster Farm it's not only just the experiment, simple life, and kind of the center of the Satyagraha struggle, but it's, you can view it as the first time that Gandhi is acting as a leader. But it's like the prototype of the future Gandhian ashram. And the Gandhian ashram is something that it's not like you sit in the mountain and you're doing meditation. It's kind of a social active ashram. And Torsta Farm, it's very, very important in this uh, respect. And they call themselves the pioneers and so on. And as I said, kibbutz, both of them were established in the same time, the first kibbutz, Kibbutz Vanya. And it's, uh, you can view it in kind of influence of Tolstoy. There were other Tolstoyan, let's say, settlements. And Louis Rich, which nothing was written about him, they were the three main supporters of Gandhi. And, and obviously, Sonia Schlesin, his secretary, but she was much more in the secretary. She was ahead of her time, a feminist, she was not accepted to the court because she was a woman at that time. I mean, and there was, the law didn't consider to accept a woman to be attorneys at that time. She was practicing uh, with Gandhi. You can see Kallenbach uh, near her. After that, she became a teacher in a school in Johannesburg and like uh, disappeared, not well, disappeared, but uh, continued her private life compared, uh, indifferent to the others. So, and, Again, in a broader aspect, you can even say that the Gandhi, 
the woman that he met here in South Africa uh, changed his view or at least opened the door for women to participate in the Indian struggle here in South Africa and later on in India. And it's Gabriel Isaac. He is the only non-Indian to sacrifice his life for the Indian struggle. I mean, he was arrested as when he came out from jail, he came out completely broken physically and mentally, and a few months later he died. So, you know, his death cause was because of his staying in jail. But nothing is written about it. Even worse than that, Gandhi doesn't mention him in his autobiography. In 38, Gandhi published a very problematic article. He, in one hand, he said that the condition of the Jews in Germany is better than the condition of the Indians was in South Africa, which this is completely wrong. And the second thing, uh, he advised the Jews to offer satyagraha, like a non-violent struggle, and to be ready to be slaughtered by, by the million. Because the whole attitude of non-violent struggles, it's not to defeat your opponent, it's to change him. But there is, when there is no any contact, no any encounter, you cannot do anything. And this is why, probably why he kept quiet, because he was mistaken in the understanding of the extreme heaviness of the Nazis. And this was really a kind of the end for a long time of looking at Gandhi as a unique person. And so, so in a way, in the Jewish and the Zionist discourse, Gandhi's name was deleted. Even some people consider him to be anti-Semitic, which is completely wrong. You know, when I did my PhD, I said jokingly that the only thing I really learned that also clever people write nonsenses. <laughs> so, you know, you cannot judge only by some nonsenses that somebody wrote. Rafael Perkel is known for his unique blend of South African Jewish music, which combines Torah and Jewish identity. His calm, spiritual approach allows for a unique sound. Raphael has been recording his latest album in Johannesburg and tells us about his Judaism, music, and how it all comes together in his latest work. It's a passion for music, really, uh, from the word go. I was given a guitar for my 12th birthday, and um, I've never looked back since. Um, it took me a while to, uh, to master the language of music, but I did it relatively quickly. I took some lessons in guitar for a year from a local teacher, um, and I, I spent a lot of time just in investigating and learning the technical language of music. And uh, so over the years, in my high school years, I, I participated in uh, rock and roll bands in those days. Um, after that, I became uh, involved in my Jewish identity at the age of 27. And my musical passion and my musical talents became directed towards expressing that aspect of my life. For me, uh, music has a very sacred purpose. Uh, I mean, music can be put to many different purposes, and many people do put it to different purposes, which are not necessarily spiritual at all. But for me, I think the central purpose and the value of music and the, in the inherent core quality within music is really a deeply spiritual one. To quote the Baal Atanya, one of the, uh, the, the most important authors of Hasidic wisdom, um, if words are the pen of the heart, we can all understand what that means, then music is the pen of the soul. So the first album that I did was in collaboration with friends, uh, a group called Nishima, 
and that were, that's going back 18 years, 18, 19 years. We did an, an album of original music, uh, including some sacred melodies uh, from the Hasidic tradition, as well as um, some Shlomo Kalebach melodies. And that's been my trend since, uh, since then. My second album was uh, a few years after that. It's going back to 2006, 2007, and that was a solo album using session musicians where I followed the same kind of pattern, uh, original songs of my own, um, combined with some tracks of Hasidic Nigunim and uh, one or two Kali Bach melodies as well. <laughs> The third album is uh, is really going to be a collection of more original melodies. I think that my songwriting is now um, reaching a more sophisticated level than ever before. The chord sequences and structures and melodic arrangements that I've got, I'm, I'm very happy with, um, are touching a, a more sophisticated space than I've done before. I've been working with Raphael uh, for the last 15 years and uh, I mean it's been an so it's been an organic uh, process and uh, he's great he comes with ideas sometimes I think what and I just give him a give him a chance and usually his ideas work out in the end he's got a, a quite a nice a very well in fact a very good musical sus and he understands the process and because we've been working together for a long time uh, the the process is is uh, quite mature, and uh, I give him the time. He and he also listens to me, which is what I like about him. If I have an idea, he'll he'll give me a chance to try it. He understands music from the inside, and a very laid back and uh, connecting person to work with. So very happy to have Neil as my producer, or co-producer, and and engineer. Ray, so let's just go for it. Let's do a, a take. Um, and if you're not happy, we'll, we can try another one. musicians that I, I've been working with in the studio on, on my new album um, are uh, Peter Sclair on bass. He's a, he's a very great talent and a very lyrical and fluid bass player, which is the kind of style that, that I like in my music. Then I brought in Louis Mschlanger, who's a very well-known Zimbabwean living in South Africa. His technique and his uh, lyrical way of playing, absolutely beautiful musician and a beautiful person to work with. Um, uh, Yunon Folkson, a local young friend who's also an upcoming t uh, talent on the Jewish music scene. Also a very beautiful songwriter, so he's responsible for, for drums and percussion. And then I've got various uh, friends that have come in with uh, voice as well, voice harmonies and uh, additional uh, voice parts. <laughs> South African Jewish music, in one sense, doesn't have any major difference from Jewish music anywhere. But for me personally, I think there's something very important about the local environment within which Jewish music is created. One of the most important things about Judaism as a religion for me personally, and I think it's uh, it's something that, that is borne out by uh, the sages in the Talmud is that the collective Jewish soul has been scattered among the nations um, to acquire connection with the local cultures and in a certain sense liberate the spiritual potential 
that exists everywhere we find ourselves. So as a Jew in Africa, um, I'm certainly influenced by African rhythms and a lot of my songs have an African flavor. <laughs> Last month, we launched a new series called Pikei Avot for Today with South Africa's Chief Rabbi, Warren Goldstein. Today, Rabbi Goldstein looks at peace and how to create it in all our relationships. One of the most well-known, famous Hebrew words, and I'm sure that every single one of you has heard this word, and you can translate it, I'm sure there's hardly a person in the world that doesn't know how to translate the following Hebrew word, shalom, which means peace. And it is such a powerful concept because it touches on the very essence of all of our relationships. And our sages teach us the importance of peace through a role model. One of the role models for the concept of peace in our lives is mentioned in uh, Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers, when it says, be of the disciples of Aaron, loving peace, pursuing peace. Now, who was Aaron? If we go back in history, we know that uh, the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt and there were incredible miracles, the 10 plagues and the splitting of the sea. And through that, God liberated them from slavery and gave them freedom. And the leaders of the people at the time were Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. They were brothers and their sister together. The three of them led the Jewish people. And Aaron was known for peace. Our sages explain how he would run between people proactively creating peace between them, that if there were two people where there was tension and conflict, he would go to the one party and to the other and he would bring them together. He was a proactive bringer of peace into the world. And that's why what the statement of our sages, it says, love peace and pursue peace. Peace is not gonna come naturally. In fact, our commentators explain that the natural state of human affairs is conflict. Isn't that an interesting thing? Sometimes we think if something's natural, well, it just must be good. But actually, human beings, we are all created, and this is what the Maharal, one of our great philosophers explains. He says, the roots of human conflict is the greatness of every human being because God created us in his image. He placed within each and every single one of us a godly soul. And that godly soul is a reflection of the greatness of God and therefore, we have within us sovereignty and majesty. And he says conflict comes when you have two sovereigns clashing. There's a sense of who are you to tell me what to do and why should I tell you what to do? And then this is mine and this is yours. Conflict emerges from that sense of independence. But the fact that conflict is natural doesn't make it good. In fact, our sages are teaching us that one of the most important values of Judaism is peace, and it's not going to come naturally. We have to pursue it with energy and with innovation and a real sense of trying to make the world into a better place and think about all of the relationships in our lives. We, you know, we, we, we like to sometimes think, well, there's peace, it's world peace. But what can you and I do about world peace? That's not something we can influence the direction of nations, even on this continent or around the world, but where we can bring peace is in our own families and in our own communities and amongst our friends. When, when there is a sense of resentment or a sense of anger, we need to work proactively to nurture peace in all of the relationships around us. That is something which is so vital. But there's another dimension of peace, which is so very powerful. You know that one of God's names, according to the Talmud, is shalom, peace. Why is God's name shalom? And uh, the Maral explains, he says, because we live in a world where there seem to be so many disparate forces in the physical universe and, and the entirety of the universe, a sense of day and night, light and darkness, summer and winter, forces pulling in different directions. What is it that holds the universe together? It is God who holds everything together. And he is the force 
of unity and that force of unity, that force, that sense of coherence of holding everything together, that is shalom, that is what peace is. Because actually the deeper meaning of the concept of peace is actually harmony. What happens in, in a beautiful piece of music? You have different elements of the music. What turns it into music? What makes it into a harmony is the fact that it is blended together to create the most magnificent experience. And that is actually the force of unity that holds the universe together. Who is that? That is God. God holds this universe together. He holds everything together, that force of shalom that brings everything together. But it even goes one step further. He gave us a way of holding and creating peace in our lives. He revealed to us the way we can live and he gives us a way of living which brings wholeness to our lives that integrates body and soul and emotions and intellect and family and community, that wholeness where we live an integrated whole life. So the concept of peace is very deep and very profound when we are called upon to bring peace into the world. It is about bringing peace into the relationships around us. It is about bringing peace into our families, into our communities, but it is also about living with inner peace. And that inner peace means connecting to shalom, to God himself. He's the source of peace in the world. If we want to live with inner peace and if we want our lives to be lives of harmony and coherence and a life of integrated wholeness, where every dimension of who we are, physical and spiritual, emotional and intellectual, family and individual and community, all of the different elements, if we want to live in harmony with ourselves and in harmony with our souls, then we need to live in harmony with God, the source of all peace, the source of all shalom. Well, that's all we have for this week's episode of Simcha, a celebration of life. As always, we'd love to hear from you. So please send us a Facebook message at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Jared Epstein and the Simcha team, Remember to be kind to yourself in this time of uncertainty.